what I want to talk about here is uh, an evaporator. I've got an evaporator that would, would reside in the cab of a machine. Uh, this would be in the uh, air duct flow where the air is being pushed or pulled by the cab circulation or cab pressurizer fan uh, through this core and the heater core. Generally, you find your air conditioning evaporator and your heater core sort of next to each other in a sort of a, st a stack. You might have the heater core here, or the heater core might be on this side. But generally, your air flow through the cab is going to travel through both cores. And of course, you'd expect the heater core to be warm when there's engine coolant flowing through it. You'd expect this evaporator to be cold when there's refrigerant flowing through it. So I just want to talk about how that works. Uh, there's another component here with this evaporator. This is an expansion valve. So this is what's known as a, a uh, H-block type expansion valve. Uh, sometimes at the inlet of the evaporator, you'll see an, an expansion valve that's like this. this. is a right angle expansion valve where the refrigerant turns 90 degrees. This one is, again, what we call an H-block. They, they both do the same job. They're just physically built a little bit different, but they've got the same components inside. This is just a little neater installation. This one's got these fragile uh, lines that have to be connected when it's changed. So let's talk about the evaporator and how evaporation makes this radiator, the evaporator, makes it cold or makes it lack heat. And in physics, heat always goes from a hotter place to a colder place. So if the cab air is moving through this core, and the cab or air is warmer than this core, then the heat energy will move into this core. And it's built just like any radiator. It's got tubes and fins, and as the airflow moves across the fins and tubes, it's going, we're going to get a heat transfer through convection uh, and conduction. Uh, so as you get the air moving through here, warm air touching a cold coil with an absence of heat, the air is going to move into it. So what makes this cold might be what you're wondering. So what I've also got here is just a can of duster gas you might use for cleaning keyboards. Uh, because this is similar, this uh, chemically is actually, yeah, what's in this duster gas is called difluoroethane. Uh, it's not commonly used as a refrigerant because it doesn't support the lubricants necessary to lubricate the compressor and other parts of the system. But uh, its chemistry is very similar to the refrigerants we do use and it, the pressures and temperatures at, at which it changes from a uh, vapor or a gas to a liquid are very similar. So when I have a can of this, if I shake it, I can feel that there's a liquid in there. But if I spray it, it comes out as a gas or a vapor. I don't see the liquid. If I invert it, well, then I'll get some liquid out because the liquid is at the bottom here and, and I'm not giving it time to, uh, to atomize. But what's happening when you spray it this way is it's held in the can under pressure. And when you, when you take these refrigerants, and in this case, uh, this difluoroethane, when you compress it, that's one of the things that likes to turn it into a liquid. When you decompress or you let the pressure off, it turns into a vapor or a gas. So uh, we don't give it time to do that. Uh, we're kind of spraying. It, of course, it does. we don't have a puddle of it when I spray it. It does vaporize in the air, but we get to see the vaporization happening. Uh, now, you wouldn't want to do this with other refrigerants because um, they are harmful to the environment. This one uh, it says it is ozone safe. Yeah, right there, it's ozone safe. Um, you don't want to inhale it or breathe ex excess amounts of this in, but it, this difluoroethane is chosen be for office environments because it's less less poisonous than than refrigerants. And you sure don't want to be breathing in the refrigerants that we're using in in heavy equipment HVAC systems. So it's it's pressurized, so it's a liquid in here. But when we let the pressure off, it vaporizes. It turns into a gas. Well, that's essentially the same thing that the expansion valve is going to do when the refrigerant passes through it in a system. So the, the nozzle on this duster gas can is kind of like the orifice effect of an expansion valve or in a simpler 
HVAC system that just has a uh, orifice tube. That's what the orifice in the orifice tube does. It acts like a restriction to flow. And as the liquid refrigerant hits it, it turns into a vapor because it's dropping in pressure, which is the same thing that's happening with this can of duster gas. Now, if you've ever stepped out of the shower on a uh, cold winter day, you know what happens when a liquid evaporates. If you've got water droplets on your skin and you get out of the shower, you immediately feel cold because those water droplets are evaporating. Well, these refrigerants are doing basically the same thing. So I've got a, a temperature probe here hooked into this meter. It's reading about 23 degrees Celsius. Let me try and set this up somewhere. So if I spray the uh, thermocouple here, You can see it went right off the scale. Now it went down to minus 40 degrees when I started spraying a liquid on that. Uh, it was very, very cold. Obviously, you want to avoid spraying that on your skin. Skin con Lots of warnings on this uh, keyboard duster about inverting the can because when you invert the can, you're releasing the liquid. When the liquid hits that thermocouple and it's evaporating, well, it's the evaporation that, that collects heat energy. So that's essentially what we want to happen inside our evaporator. We can put a pressurized chemical similar to this. If we can put uh, an R134A refrigerant or an R12 refrigerant or some of the compounds that are commonly found throughout history in HVAC systems in the air conditioning side or residential refrigerants or something in an appliance like a refrigerator or an air conditioner, uh, we're going to basically do the same thing. What's going to happen is the liquid's going to going to exit uh, from the um, from either the orifice tube or the expansion valve, and as it sprays in this line and starts to travel through the core of the evaporator, we're going to have that liquid to vapor. Uh, chemical reaction that's going to make this core very, very cold. And when something's cold and you pass warm air through it, naturally by physics, the heat transfers into the cold device. And they're going to use something like copper or aluminum because it has, it's a really good conductor, not only of electricity, but of heat. So that's why we find any radiator made out of those types of high conductance uh, metals but very fragile components. So you got to be careful if you're removing or installing this. We've got fairly thin aluminum tubes. Those might be 20 thousandths of an inch thick on the corners, on the edges here. So you've got to be very cautious when you're working around under in, in the cab around the uh, heater core and the evaporator. Now you saw the temperature drop on my uh, thermometer there when we sprayed the thermocouple to minus 40. Very, very cold. Actually, way below that it went right off the scale and and you know gave us a reading that it was off the scale however low that could go um, if we just let an unregulated quantity of refrigerant evaporate inside the evaporator core it would immediately get so cold that any moisture in the air passing through it and the, and the cab where an operator is working is generally a humid environment that moisture would immediately turn this into a big block of ice so we don't want uh, uncontrolled evaporation happening. So that's where the expansion valve comes in. The expansion valve, what's in here is a little valve that can move back and forth. And what's going to determine how, how big or small the orifice effect is as the refrigerant passes through um, this hole. So refrigerant as a liquid is entering here. It's crossing the... Uh, expansion valve, it's spraying out as a vapor here, but how much of that we let through is adjustable in an expansion valve. So there is a little uh, stem, you can see in there, there's a stem that connects up here and what's on top here on this end, and this one's got some foam to kind of insulate it, is a diaphragm. And that diaphragm is connected, or basically is connected to a, um, a tube uh, called a capillary, and the capillary has some, some gas in it itself, which might be nitrogen or depending on the, whatever they put in there at the factory, it might actually be refrigerant. But as, uh, as the refrigerant exits the evaporator, 
you notice it crosses again through this expansion valve. So this is particularly an H-block expansion valve. So refrigerant comes in as a liquid. The valve opening determines how much of it vaporizes. Then as it comes back, its temperature is sensed as it crosses again. And that temperature coming across here regulates by heating or cooling the capillary. And as the capillary heats up, it expands. And what that'll do when it expands and heats up is it'll push down and open the orifice more. It'll open the opening more, so more refrigerant will flow. So it's kind of an automatic compensating valve. It's temperature sensing. If, the, if there's a warm temperature here, then that capillary and diaphragm will open the valve more and let more refrigerant flow through. If it's coming out of the evaporator cold, hasn't collected much heat, and therefore it's risked, it's, there's a risk of it freezing up, well then this is calibrated to start to choke off that refrigerant flow. So the orifice will start to shrink down and less refrigerant will be going through the evaporator. So that is the job of the expansion valve, or thermostatic expansion valve, sometimes called a TXV. Its job is to automatically regulate the flow through the evaporator based on the temperature it's feeling coming out of the evaporator. And if it comes out warm, open up, give it more refrigerant flow for more cooling. If it's coming back cold, if it's a cloudy day, well then this uh, evaporator, or this expansion valve has probably got the the valve fairly small and we're not sending much refrigerant through the evaporator. If it's a hot sunny day and lots of heat's coming through the cab windows, uh, then this expansion valve should be automatically opening more to let more refrigerant flow. And it has to be calibrated properly for the system. You can't just take any expansion valve that fits and install it on any system. The, uh, the spring rate and the orifice size is all calibrated at the factory and they've got part numbers on them and the part number has to be the right one for the system. If you worked in residential or commercial refrigeration and you're on the roof of a, an office tower working on a bunch of refrigeration units, well then they, those technicians may be adjusting uh, spring rates and changing orifice sizes, but in mobile HVAC, we just replace a faulty expansion valve with one with the same proper part number. If your system has a right angle expansion valve, there's a couple of different designs of this, but it's basically the same valve. It's got the diaphragm on here, but the capillary, instead of being internal in the H block, is a tube here, and this tube is hollow. This is a little pipe, and inside this pipe is the gas. So this could be a nitrogen or some refrigerant that, that they put in there at the factory, and then it's crimped and sealed shut. So there's a pressurized gas in there, and as you heat this up, if I put my hand around there and warm that up, uh, that's going to raise the pressure to the diaphragm, and that's going to push the expansion valve opening open more. So that's right now while I'm squeezing that, even just here on the in the room here, I'm opening up that orifice a little bit so more refrigerant would flow through it. And then uh, as it cools down, that orifice would be closing. So when you install one of these expansion valves, you have to clamp this capillary tube to the outlet line from the evaporator. So it's a little more involved installation. You have to uh, kind of weave this through. You have to be careful because it's fragile. You're going to have to bend this into the right curves and positions. It might come in the box all curled up. You're going to have to uncurl it and then you're going to have to feed it in and then you're going to clamp it to the outlet of the evaporator and then there's usually some foam tape that wraps around that to sort of make sure it's, it is well sensing the temperature coming out of the evaporator. Then this other line coming off here is what's called a balance line. And this is built into most H-block expansion valves, but again, you don't see it because it's internal. And what this will do is when your clutch first engages, uh, your uh, clutch cycles on and starts pulling refrigerant through. If this orifice was very small, let's say it's a cloudy day and it's not very warm in the cab and there wasn't much heat being sensed, so the orifice in here was fairly small, the valve had been regulated almost closed, then your clutch engages and the compressor starts to draw refrigerant through the expansion valve or try to. If the refrigerant is really restricted by the expansion valve, 
well that can cause your compressor to pull a big vacuum on the suction side and it can chirp the belt you know, if you have a, a system where every time the air compressor or air conditioning compressor kicks on you know the belt squeals or chirps briefly well that can be because the expansion valve is not letting the refrigerant flow so what this balance line does is this connects to the suction line to the uh, compressor and when the compressor comes on it pulls a vacuum there and just momentarily tugs on that diaphragm and just momentarily opens up the uh, orifice inside the expansion valve to let more refrigerant flow so there's not a big load on the compressor and the belt every time the clutch engages so again that's typically built into the uh, into the return of the H block expansion valve. Internally here, it will just pull the valve open with, with vacuum or negative pressure.